Hello everyone, uh, this is Om Swami. Uh, we'll start with a small invocation to Lord Ganesha. Om Vakratunda Mahakaya Surya Koti Samaprabha Nirviganam Kuru Me Dev Sarvakareshu Sarvada First of all, I offer my obeisance to the Divine in you, with whose grace we're all here right now, this moment. I am uh, quite pleased today to be in the company of somebody very, very special. And uh, it is as much my honor as pleasure to be conversing with uh, this young, handsome, brilliant genius, the pride of our nation, I mean it absolutely, the pride of our nation, Vidit Gujarati. And uh, Vidit is a uh, chess grandmaster. Uh, he became a chess grandmaster at the age of 18, and he's currently India's number three uh, in terms of ranking. And I always feel that uh, some things we are born with and some things, you know, we have to work for. Probably the ratio in my mind is... 95 and 5. That is, 5% 5 of some things we are born with and 95% is what we really have to work towards in life. Mm -hmm. predominantly, because, predominantly because we have this temperament. Sometimes when we are small, when we are very young, uh, often uh, some kids are very outgoing from the beginning. Yeah they like basketball or cricket uh, or soccer whereas some like to sit indoors and uh, break apart things and join them back and play chess or read books R the real discovery in my view of one's state of self-realization is for them to be able to walk the path they're aligned with because I think if we asked Einstein and Buddha to swap places, both would fail. Or both would succeed in a different manner. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that uh, Vidit was uh, coming to the ashram, uh, I was uh, so happy. As soon as I found out, I said, uh, please request him to take an hour out of his time or 45 minutes or so. So we can uh, get into the mind of a uh, genius and uh, find out uh, how he thinks, how he lives, uh, what motivates him. And uh, in return, I'll be happy to grant him some questions he can fire at me. Uh, and I think that would be a, a good start. So, welcome with it. Thank you, Swamiji, for this opportunity and your blessings. Most welcome. <laughs> I'm really lucky to have a conversation with you. It's, yeah. it's divine grace. I'm just as lucky as, <laughs> as well, you know, to have you uh, here. So my question is, when did you start playing chess? And uh, why chess? Actually, I was around seven when I started chess. But there was no such plan uh, to go for chess. I used to play many sports like cricket, uh, like every Indian kid, I used to play cricket and I went to join a club uh, but they said that I'm too young, the ball might hit me and I might get injured and I used to play dad uh, with my dad uh, chess at home so that was the other option I had and badminton but I knew chess so I thought okay I'll pick up chess and that's how it started. There was no planning or so but just kind of one thing uh, led to another. Wow. Yeah. I'm so glad you were too young for, for, the, for the game of cricket. <laughs> we have plenty of uh, good cricketers in this nation, but we need uh, more and more people who represent our country in other spheres, uh, whether mm -hmm. that's chess and something else. How long was it before you won your first tournament? From the moment you started playing and then maybe started thinking about going into tournament to the time you won your first tournament? I, I, I remember distinctly my first tournament which I played, uh, which was outside my city. And there was this place where uh, they did not allow parents to sit in or spectate. And I was uh, very attached to my dad. And when I could not see him, 
I panicked and I could not play the first game. So I told I resign, and the opponent said, "No, you cannot resign." And I was very insistent that I want to lose the game. <laughs> so this is how it began. So winning was far away, but um, I had this competitiveness because I did not like uh, losing. So once I got used to that, okay, dad is just around here; he's not leaving anywhere. I started playing. But my first victory, I think I would say major victory, was uh, under 11 national championship. Right. And before that, when I was nine years old, I won a tournament in Maharashtra, which gave me the opportunity to see the World Cup, which was happening in India in Hyderabad. Right. And I could see Vishwanathan Anand uh, playing his final match, where he won against uh, Uzbek Grandmaster. Right. So that opened my eyes, and then I took, I think, I started working seriously on chess. That's right. how it started. So, so you started playing at seven, yeah. and you won your first tournament. Just when you were nine years old, yeah. and then you won one, another one when yes. you were under eleven. Yeah, under that's 11. quite remarkable. I didn't win any for the first five or six years. <laughs> <laughs> how did you come into chess? Like, how did you like chess? Um, well, I will I will happily talk about it, but I don't think it's relevant because I'm not <laughs> a grandmaster. <laughs> for me, it's just a hobby, uh, or was I uh, have not played in years now. So I was uh, very young. um maybe five or six and we had this person uh, i only know him as dr pande so dr pande had moved from bihar to to my place patiala and my father helped him secure accommodation and so on so he came to our place and he said uh, the three siblings were sitting there and he said you kids should play chess and and i said so i think we had one of these board games where there was ludo something else and and also chess so you reverse okay. the the thing and there was chess ah, okay. with those uh, pieces if you blow at them they will just fly <laughs> away <laughs> so i had my first game with him and it was wonderful to lose because it gave me the possibility that victory was an option you know and it was a beautiful feeling to know that one day i could uh, win and yes did but i did not uh, take any coaching or anything um so he taught me the rules and then then i started playing from there on it's like this uh, if somebody drinks alcohol you know it doesn't matter where they go they can go to even the most holiest of the holy places within 10 minutes they will find a place from where they can source <laughs> alcohol <laughs> the desire to drink propels them to find an avenue mm. similarly in my case and i think it happens in the case of most people the desire to do something in life deeply if you are really committed then you automatically find those around you who can help you mm-hmm. and so i learned from him and then i found other kids who used to play in the vicinity and then i would start mm-hmm. to play a little bit mm-hmm. and then in my school um that time actually school thing came much later now i recalling nobody ever asked me this question so I, it's <laughs> not something i ever thought about. so that's how i got into it so i've never taken coaching though Uh, okay. in chess so me ji you said now that if you have the strong desire you automatically find the right people to support you so in many times uh, like some some people might have desire but they don't know what they should uh, i mean how they should they should proceed so what should be the path ideal path if someone wants to pursue uh, any career and what what can be the path which will lead to good success or uh, what should be the mindset and action So first of all success is a very rel- relative term. Uh what is success to one person may not be success to another person. So let's assume success as a generic term okay. where they may reach a level that they are at the pinnacle in their industry uh, either in terms of chess they have become a, a GM or even a world champion uh or pinnacle could be um being very rich or mm-hmm. building a company taking it public and 
and having that success there or or selling that company or or you know getting acquired whatever that success may be the main problem and i think with it you know it better than anybody else winning the first or the second tournament was only the very beginning indeed from zero to an international master it might have taken you let's say 5 years or or x number of years but from im to gm the road is very difficult mm-hmm. so people who hit the pinnacle of any field the absolute zenith they are in a way perfectionists and extremely disciplined people if you're aiming for perfection and you you don't want anything less than that and you are willing to sacrifice in life <coughs> then you start to progress automatically the m- greatest mistake we can make is to keep waiting for the right coach or mentor or the right person to come along mm-hmm. the best thing one can do is to keep working on with whatever resources we have to not stop working on something because only actions will bring results my dreams will not bring results my thoughts will propel me maybe but they will not actually bring results tangible results will come from core and hardcore practice and that discipline and that strategy to prepare for success and i think that's very key a to not give up because naga baba you know my guru used to say this thing he said बेटा अगर अंधेरे में भी पत्थर मार रहे हैं सौ भी मारेंगे एक तो लगेगा ना कहीं माय गुरु यू से इवन इफ यू आर हर्लिंग स्टोन्स एट नाइट एट अ टारगेट एंड यू कैन सी अ थिंग इफ यू आर हर्लिंग हंड्रेड यू विल गेट क्लोज समवेयर इट इज दैट्स हाउ द नंबर्स गेम वर्क बट फोकस्ड एफर्ट इज वेरी की एंड दैट दैट Uh, propensity or what should i call it that will that undying relentless desire uh, to aim for excellence mm-hmm. is at the base of all success because one thing i've noticed having met many successful people materially in particular they never waste time mm-hmm. time is so critical to them they are very good with how they manage their time and that leads me to a question for you do you kind of agree with what i'm saying and how do you manage your time what is your usual what does your usual day look like when i'm training like very seriously then it's um, i the distractions are completely out and that helps me focus distractions like um even like some mundane work uh i try to if i'm working let's say and if i have to send an email or something someone calls me and then says okay you have to do this okay so i do that and then again if i keep breaking this focus i find it hard to i don't find that rhythm somehow and i feel that it's getting disconnected so when i'm having a training session and it's continuous 4 hours of just chess 5 hours 6 hours just chess very nice and if i'm working with someone who is uh also that motivated or even more, more motivated than me then uh, it helps me to bring more energy and have uh, focus for over long period of time so that time i don't feel that i'm working at all and the time just flies by and i'm this time management it's not an issue usually but when i'm at uh, i'm not working I'm at home i'm just doing casual practice i notice that this distractions uh, kind of bother me in this uh, pursuit so i guess it's better to have an ideal environment i guess that's pl- that plays a very important role uh, in uh, any s- practice or sadhana i guess to have and a good environment and by distractions um, things like you know social media internet yeah. youtube and, yes, exactly. and what have you so Those i things. think yeah. even if you were in the most ideal environment technology is everywhere yeah so what measures do you take to to eliminate those distractions I don't uh, think that I particularly take any measures 
it just so sometimes happens that when i'm working i am enjoying it so much that i don't feel the need to have the phone out or check something and it especially helps if i just keep the phones on silent mode and somewhere far away because if even if then i realize that usually if someone is asking something it's not urgent you can always do it a bit later and this helps me once if, if i keep all the phone everything away from me and when i'm practicing then i find that okay i'm enjoying i'm in the flow as they say but uh, if i sometimes have phone i get a message i get uh, some notification i check it and then <laughs> the complete routine is uh, collapsed <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> so you have two kinds of training casual and yeah you, intense yes usually like if i have a training environment where i'm working with coach or uh, some of my friends who are like higher rated than me so i work with them then i notice that it's flawless but sometimes when i'm at home alone i think that's the <laughs> <laughs> most dangerous when you're alone you yeah. are tempted to check the messages or something or check youtube right. something like this right. and once you get into that spiral i notice that it just keeps on going one after the other yeah. you don't even realize from where you started exactly So you could you be examining a chess move and the next thing you know you're seeing a cat jumping <laughs> over a puddle or something yes <laughs> happens <laughs> and that too after like 5 or 6 hours you know yes okay so you were saying something sorry yeah uh, before uh, you said that uh, you have seen successful people aim at excellence and that is the kind of key so if i'm aiming for let's say i'm playing a game and I'm just thinking how best to play this but what happens is sometimes the result the outcome or uh, what will happen or once I let's say I was winning a game and then I drew it it affects me it bothers me so what would be your advice on something not to get attached to the results or how should we handle such thing when the results start to bother and it gets in the way of the process it's a very good question <clears throat> I think when we are working towards something it's quite natural that we are attached to the outcome. Yeah. It's natural to feel bad if we don't succeed. I'm yet to meet any sane person who loses and say hey, it was great to lose lovely, you know. Okay. I think uh, if you're sane you will feel bad if you lose. Mm-hmm. Because you're not playing for anything else but a victory so it's natural that i was working towards something and that didn't get accomplished so i'm going to feel bad mm-hmm. what happens in the mind of a very composed person they are able to take some steps immediately to come out of that mood okay because when we lose we could feel tremendous guilt or we could go the other way where we'll say well the whole world is out there to get me the other people just had better opportunities more advantage and that's why they're winning if i'm going to hold something else responsible for my loss that's a very dumb thing to do it's very detrimental to one's success mm-hmm. because if i'm holding somebody else responsible then i will think oh um i didn't lose he won or she won because they were just they just had better arrangement or or resources so the first thing that that should happen is rather than going in a mode of low self esteem depression or self guilt uh, or on a guilt trip it's better to spend that energy and time in a doing something creative and b being more positive Now I cannot be more positive just by saying hey I'm going to be positive because emotions and my results will keep nagging me keep tugging at my consciousness from from behind saying hey but you lost you lost you're a loser you know mm-hmm. big yeah. l on your forehead and so on <laughs> but if I am focused if I am focused on doing something creative at that moment then I will be able to come out of it faster second very important method particularly in the in the case of chess is to analyze your game yeah and when you annotate and analyze your own game then you start to see your flaws yeah. and that is a great 
discovery and a starting point to get to the next level. And same happens in all the other areas of life as well, where we, if I can analyze myself objectively, then I am bound to grow and evolve. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable. If I take responsibility for my flaws, not by feeling guilty, but by taking action, I'm going to grow. Okay. No question about it. And one, one time, you know, um, I just recall this little incident. I was uh, playing golf. This was many years ago. <coughs> and the person who was playing with me was an executive in a, a corporate. And later he joined my company as well, in fact. So he said something to me quite beautiful. He said, you know, why I like golf, That why he liked golf. Mm -hmm. He said, I like golf because in this you're not competing against anybody but yourself. Mm -hmm. As they say in Bhagavad Gita, Udred Atmana Atmanam na Atmanam Vasade. Atma Vi Atmano Bandhur Atma Vripur Atmana. You are your own best friend and your own worst enemy. You're only competing with yourself. So he said what was really remarkable is in, in golf, you're not competing against anybody. Mm -hmm. If you can keep your mind together, your, your emotions together, when you make a wrong swing and or you end up with a double bogey or something, then you will make progress on the next hole and the next hole and the next hole. Yeah. And from that angle, it's paramount. It's absolutely critical to know my strengths and weaknesses and know what makes me feel positive. I'm not talking about happy. Just what makes me feel positive. Mm -hmm. And I've seen when you do something creative, you, after a period of time, could be 10 minutes, could be 20, could be half an hour, your positive mind will take over. Right. So usually, like when, if we, this is actually very interesting because when we watch something like a movie or let's say TV show, it's a distraction. We feel good at that moment. But later on, we feel that we didn't use this time effectively. At least I feel that. Yes. It's so a global phenomenon. <laughs> and if I use that time 20 minutes in something, let's say, some sport or something, where I even work on my physical fitness, let's say, then I don't feel that it was a waste of time. And I, I was happy as well as uh, I felt that the, it was, I put the time to good use. Yes. So something creative, some work would be yes. ideal. And Swamiji, in a lot of your videos, you have said that... Uh, Dharma is something which is right for oneself and doing that should be your karma. So how do we find out for each of us what is right for oneself? How do we know which action should we take or like what path should we walk on? It's a very good question because <clears throat> I think it's something we all face on a daily basis multiple times during the day. Yes. Life is all about choices. And uh, repeatedly, we have to make choices. Yeah. Should I eat this? Or should I eat that? Or should I skip my meal? Should I sleep? Should I practice? Should I play? Should I exercise? Or should I just lie down and, and watch maybe uh, YouTube, TV, Netflix, whatever? A weak mind gives into gives into temptations very quickly. Mm -hmm. There can be no absolute rule of saying this is the right thing to do at any point in time, this is the wrong thing to do. Because absolute rules are what make us guilty to begin with. Mm -hmm. It all depends on a case-by-case -case basis. But the method of determining how best to do it is A. If I am clear about my goal, then I will also be clear about my priorities in life. Mm -hmm. If I'm clear about my priorities in life, 
then it will be easy for me to form some principles in my life. If my goal, my priorities and my principles are clear to me, decision making is a piece of cake in anything. If my priority is that I need to write a book, for example, I have a similar lifestyle to yours, in fact. Um, only I get to have more fun, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, I write books for a living. And my books aren't doing that well, by the way. But still, I doubt uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the truth. But I'm not writing for the mass audience. I, I write because I have a story to tell. Mm. Or I have a message to share. So when I write, some days I'm writing up to 16 hours in a day. Wow. So I would get up like 2 a.m., sometimes even 1 a.m. 2, 2 and 2 30, I would get up, I will take my shower and so on. Then um, I, I always either explicitly or otherwise I start my day with a little prayer. And then I, I'll start my day and then I will get on to straight away on my uh, computer. Uh, usually, in the, since the last two years, I do all my writing while walking. I have a treadmill desk, I walk and I write. While I, walking? Yes, I don't, because I don't like to sit down so much. Okay. My life is very sedentary and it's not good for the health or the brain for that matter. Mm -hmm. So then I would write, let's say from 3 a.m. till 7.30. Uh, no matter where I'm in the world, at 7.30, I usually have my breakfast, mm -hmm. except on event times here when I do it at 8. Okay. So from 7.30 till 8, 8.15, I'll have my breakfast. Around 8.15, I might take a little stroll, okay. just like for five, six minutes. And then I will resume my writing. I will write till 11.30. And then 11.30 I'll have my lunch, um, which will I'll be done by 12 or 12.15. Then I, I'm thinking about my book. Some days I will take a nap. Some days I don't, depending on how I'm feeling. If I'm not taking a nap, I'll get straight on to my writing again. And then I will write till 5.30. 5.30 is when I have my dinner. The last meal of my day is at 5.30. Mm. So 5.30 I'll eat my dinner. Till 6 I'll write. And then uh, 6 I'll eat and so on. Around 6-ish I will go for a stroll. And if I'm writing in the ashram then I will around 3-ish or early morning I'll do my exercise as well. But if, if during intense days then I will go, I will just walk a little. And then I will come back around 7.30 and then write again till 10.30 or more mm. and then sleep for four hours or so. Sometimes I'm unable to even do that. But on days I'm not doing intense writing. I struggle to even write a blog post. Mm -hmm. I am, I don't know what to call it. I cannot call it wasting my time because I'm responding to people's queries. Um, doing things with the ashram or the Black Lotus app or technologies. Black Lotus Technologies mm -hmm. is the company that owns the app. Or Black Lotus Peace Foundation or meeting people here or giving discourses or meeting with the residents and so on. But even when I'm not doing that, I feel if I go in intense mode, I'm able to work better. Mm -hmm. In this day and age, I think those days are gone when people could uh, just say, I'm going to turn my phone off forever. I'm going to turn my computer off forever. Mm -hmm. It's just not possible. Technology, while it is uh, causing uh, havoc in our lives, it also has its advantages. Yeah. You know, today sitting at home, you can watch the games of all the world players. That's something we couldn't do 20 years ago. Yeah. When I was growing up, I used to get chess in for Matt, you know, yeah, that, yeah, that magazine, big book yeah. and uh, and so on. So procrastination is easier to handle if I know where I'm heading. Okay. And some reminder, something that reminds me during the day, I should not be doing this. And that comes with great mindfulness. That is, what 
am I doing right now? That question I should be able to ask myself. What am I doing right now? The moment you ask, <clears throat> the moment you ask that question, you are instantly brought back to the present moment. Yes. And two, what should I be doing right now? Am I doing the right thing? Or yes. Not? And limiting the use of technology is most certainly the way to make better use of your time. Okay. Even if you're running a technology company, you have to limit the use of technology in your, okay. in your daily life. So my question to you uh, with it would be, how often do you train and how often do you train in that intense mode? And what other things uh, are you doing or what is your goal? Actually, that's what I mean to say. Uh, okay. When I'm uh, playing in a tournament, it's usually very intense. So I need actually, I don't know if I need, but I feel fresh if I get at least eight to nine hours of sleep during the event. Needed, Because yes. the game lasts for six hours. So sometimes I feel fatigued if yes. I have not slept well. Yes. And so after I wake up in the morning, um, I get ready, have breakfast and then I start working at a stretch for like three, four hours before the game. I check my opponent's games, how he plays and so on. And then the game could last any time between two hours to six hours on an average. And after that, I come back again, I check the game, what mistakes I made and then the next game. So it's a very, uh, it's a cycle and it, I guess, a chess player must be just sleeping and eating during that time, no other thing, just practicing uh, and then sleeping, eating, that's it. Awesome. Um, but I find that when I'm, uh, I return from a tournament, I'm so exhausted that I'm not able to again work. Yes. But once, I think in one of your videos, you had said that you had given a very interesting example. If you make a cake uh, and you prepare it, you put in a lot of effort. After two hours, you just don't uh, start making another cake. Mm -hmm. Once you've made it, you try to enjoy it. You switch off and switch on. So now I'm trying to do that. Once I come from a tournament, I try to relax for a few days and then again begin so that the intensity is there and I'm not just doing it for the sake of doing it. Plus willpower is a resource, you know, willpower. If I'm going to spend it on things that don't matter, I won't have any of it left to do it, to invest it on things that actually do matter. True. So, uh, what is your goal like? Uh, are you working towards something? Well, right now I would say it's more of a dream than a goal. Okay. Be uh, to what, is, what according to you is the difference? Well, I've learned it from you <laughs> and okay, your videos. I want to know you in your words, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> well, as you said, goal needs to have a timeline and some certain period you give yourself that, okay, I want to achieve this. And right now I've not given any timeline to myself. So, so like that but of course I would like to become the world champion in chess that's my aim uh, now I'm trying to convert it into a goal to have a certain time frame where I plan it out now right now I just have like short term goals where I focus on next tournament like next three four months tournament yeah. but on the long term goal I've not made like a systematic plan as such okay. I understand you played with Magnus Carlsen. Carlsen is the current world chess champion, champion yeah. and you drew against him in classical yes. game. That, that was a great feeling. To, that It gave me a lot of confidence that I can play against the best in the world right. and still manage to hold my ground. Uh, right now he is dominating for I think seven to eight years. So, so are you telling him Magnus move over? <laughs> Well, with your blessings, I think I, I might be able to okay. do that. <laughs> <laughs> because I think you hit upon a very, um, <clears throat> you hit upon a very subtle but very important thing. You used the phrase systematic plan. You know, I heard Dr. Wayne Dyer say once uh, in one of his talks, uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Mm -hmm. I think... That plan is very key. And I have a question for you. What do you think is your greatest hurdle or top three hurdles or maybe the greatest to begin with between where you are now? What is your current rating? My rating is 2707. Okay. And uh, world rank is I think 33. That's That's remarkable. Like that. So from 33rd to the 1st, what do you think is your greatest hurdle? Because you don't lack the brain power, uh, clearly. 
if you drew against the world number one player, you can win as well. And if you can consistently, you know how in a game of tennis, uh, when uh, two in a final Grand Slam or something, two players are playing, every single shot matters a great deal. Yes. You you sh show slackness on just one return or one serve, and that could be the whole game, the title gone out of your hands. Mm -hmm. So every game, every minute matters. Yes. So. What do you think is the greatest hurdle? What is stopping you from going from, you know, 33 to 1? Well, I think uh, it's w one of the things I think is my mindset. And that's when I play or before the game, um, I feel anxious or nervous. I don't feel that if I'm playing against someone who is uh, higher rated than me, then I'm feeling the feeling of excitement that, oh, I'm going to play him, I'm going to learn so much. But sometimes when you're playing a weaker opposition, I feel that, oh, I have to win against him. And sometimes there's a lot to lose. And this feeling, uh, I feel, is counterproductive. And it is, yes, yeah, super counterproductive. You know, when Kasparov played against Deep Blue, yes. uh, IBM's uh, Deep Blue supercomputer, after he... Uh, played a game and they asked him how was it after the tournament he said you know the most uh, uh, disturbing thing for him was in a normal tournament when a human being is sitting uh, opposite to him he can look at him and uh, his yeah. this person's already you know getting fuzzy in his Indeed. brain and he's getting all jelly I'm playing against Kasparov this guy I'm, there's no way I'm gonna win and he said, looking into Deep Blue, I could not <laughs> evoke any fear. You know, Deep Blue That's doesn't true. care or didn't care. Completely. So, this is very important what you've said, that that anxiety. So, do you do any mental training? Um, well, I just watch your videos, your books, and I try to meditate for some time. But I think once you had said that... Doing wrong meditation is more harmful than uh, doing meditation just for like proper meditation for 10 minutes. So, so all world-class athletes spend a great deal of their time on mental training as well. Mm -hmm. And mental training as well as playing chess in your mind. Um, so I was once reading this book. I don't remember the name now. Whether that... I, I would be guessing, so better not to guess. But it, in that, it, were, it had a story of Michael Phelps. Mm -hmm. And I think Michael Phelps holds, holds the world record. He won some 22 gold medals in Olympics for the US in swimming. Mm -hmm. One person over, I think, two or three uh, Olympics. Olympics, yeah. So he has almost a ritual that he does before he jumps in the pool. So he would, before the night, night before, he would eat the same meal. Same meal before any major tournament. He eat the same kind of food the day before. He'll have the same kind of routine. He will not break that. And then when he is close to the pool next day, he will same, he'll w hear the same, listen to the same music. Mm -hmm. And then he has this thing, he will step on the, that, that whatever, that stage, little thing, whatever. Yeah, it's before the jump. Yeah. yeah. And then he would step down, then would step back on. He has this little ritual which helps him get into what we call a state of flow. Mm -hmm. And flow, this term, the state of flow, was used by this uh, Russian Mikhail. philosopher, Mihai Chiksen Mihai. Yeah. So, I think two things. If anybody could work on in any field, they would certainly benefit a great deal. One is mental training. Mm -hmm. And second is practice. How should one do mental training according so to So I would it would depend from one field to another. If my uh, if my trouble is with uh, anxiety or just that genuine fear or nervousness that mm -hmm. kicks in mental training in chess would be in multiple ways. One is to meditate, visualizing, playing, and winning. Okay. Winning a world tournament, 
lifting the championship trophy and uh, shaking hands with world champions saying, well, you didn't do too bad either, something like that, you know. <laughs> okay. Imagining yourself as a winner. Okay. And imagining in that visualization that when you are out there to play that game, at that time you are very calm and composed and mm -hmm. you are very happy. But the real training is not this. This is patchwork. Okay. Real training is when you win a game, at that time remember how you are feeling, what you are wearing, what you had to eat, what you were thinking and, and what your surroundings were, were like. Mm -hmm etching that feeling on your mind and then being able to recall that will send you in that zone. Okay. So training must happen when you are happy and you are winning mm -hmm. to recall that. Okay. Right? And that is going to play a huge role because the next time you are going you just have to replicate some of those factors and brain will immediately get into that euphoric mode mm. and that easy mode because you will make the greatest moves under pressure but relaxed. Yes. When you're too relaxed, pff, it's yeah. going to no. be a loss. When you are too tense, you can't think because yeah. brain is a muscle. If my, if my fist is, I lose the flexibility, you know, in badminton. And that was one of the sports I took great coaching in. The coach will say, you just have to use your thumb and and just this flick will send the shuttle from one corner to the other extreme baseline that's backhand you know just this little flick yeah. and this power comes from a relaxed wrist relaxed arm relaxed hand and relaxed mm -hmm. mind if i'm tense i cannot get that power in my thumb by just that little flick so if i'm going like this too much pressure oh, yeah. economy of motion is lost okay <laughs> i just go like this this is just the movement just Racket I'm going to use and this flick and the shuttle goes boom. You know that explosive power comes with practice though and that's the second point. <coughs> Visualization alone will not cut it. Mm -hmm. It must be substantiated with extraordinary practice. A lot of practice and disciplined practice. I think if you're not practicing six to eight hours every single day, you're not doing justice to your brain. It's a powerhouse at your age and at your at the juncture, at your stage where you have made such a name in this uh, field, in this sport, and there is so much more you could do. It's with it. No more YouTube, okay? <laughs> just joking. So just make it a point. I have to practice. Yeah. You know, we give importance to insignificant things in life sometimes. We give importance to insignificant things. We'll say, oh, um, I need to do this at 11.30. I have to have my lunch, for example. So I'm going to base everything around that. It could be done differently as well. I could say from 6 a.m. till 10 a.m. I have to practice. So I'm going to base everything around that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe two or three stretches of two to three hours As every you said, day. priorities, to have the priorities exactly. clear. During my days of meditation... Um, I meditated up to 22 hours a day. It was the most intense effort I'd ever put in into anything. And it was really remarkable. So I think on that note, um, we would uh, draw it to a closure. So I just wanted to know, um, A, what is success according to you? And uh, B, any message you would like to give to aspiring people in the respective fields? Um, first of all, again, I would like to express my gratitude no, for this opportunity. No, I'm thankful. And uh, regarding your question, success, I've noticed that when I feel happy and it, like genuine happiness, then I feel, okay, uh, that is some kind of a success. And many times I based it on the results or games, but sometimes I feel happy just for no reason. That also I feel could be a success that I'm enjoying my life. But of course, uh, career-wise, uh, I have some aims. So if I complete that, that would be the success. Don't use if. Just <laughs> do it. Yes. And Swamiji, what was the second part of the question? I forgot. Um, any message? message for, no. But before you give that, I have one more question now. So don't use if, okay? Don't say if I succeed. Mm -hmm. You, you say, oh, look, thing. it's do or die. I, I have to do this. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm born to do. 
and I've spent my life or since the age of seven now you are 20 24 24 from 7 till 24 I've spent 18 years of my life doing this thing or 17 I have to do this at least to a degree where you say I've given my best that's yeah. that's in my view success is when you can say I did the best I could not thinking I wish I'd practice six hours or eight yes. hours rather than two hours I yeah. also feel uh, that same way when I give everything I could and even if it doesn't happen I feel some peace that okay at least what it was in my control I did that yeah. so my second question uh, is if not chess then what else if you were not in chess what would you think you would be doing I like uh, um, reading and uh, doing a lot of research or something right so something I would try to uh, research on something intellectual topic maybe and I'm some very curious by nature so if I I have a lot of questions so I just try would try to find those answers I don't know which field I would be may probably scientist maybe okay <laughs> that would, you would be make a great scientist <laughs> I'm sure Thank when you. you're not watching YouTube <laughs> <laughs> just joking okay any message you'd like to because you're an inspiration for for many people including myself and uh, oh, yes know. absolutely I I love people who who do something good with their time in life you know you make this world a better place so uh, how many grandmasters India has currently India has I think 54, 54. Uh, and you're ranked number three right, in the whole three. of India yeah. I don't know that's phenomenal so any message you'd like to give one thing would I found very useful was to meditate every day um, it when I start the day with meditation I found it very useful so if someone who is not doing it I'm, I don't know if I'm doing it well but I just try, as you said in your books many times to have this concentrative meditation to think of a thought or some picture in your mind and just uh, focus on that and if I sometimes do it correctly I feel that re the rest of my day goes really well uh, I mean, uh, I don't go get into the distractions actually because my somehow it just happens that I do the right things. Nice. So, uh, myself, I'm trying to improve my meditation practice, but if someone is not doing it, I would really tell them to do it. And what happens is the first step is the toughest to sit down to meditate, but once you start doing it, then you also feel the joy of it. And, and, and I think in anything, I've noticed that if you start working, you, if you think that, okay, I have to do this, but once you start, you easily do it, like giving an exam. But before that, you are really anxious or worried. So I would say just, yeah, meditation and uh, taking the path of action. If something is bothering you, just take the right action. That would be, from my life, I have learned only that thing. And what do you do when you're angry? When I'm angry? Uh, Does it happen often? It used to happen, like after I used to lose a game, I get, used to get very angry with myself. Uh, but now, I have tried to, somehow it has just gone, I don't know, I mean not completely gone, I still get angry, but a recovery time is faster. And on your <coughs> last blog also you said when you get angry you should delay it for 24 <laughs> hours. Yes. So And I think uh, that's one of the things because anger is energy. And when you are using your mental energy in something mm, like chess, and you're using it all the time, it absorbs your energy. You don't have the energy left yeah. to be angry, actually, True. you know, often. And uh, one absolute last question. What is your favorite food? Favorite food? <laughs> Indian food, I love. Cuisine. Indian cuisine. Indian cuisine. Okay, within Indian cuisine, what food? What particular item or dish or, or something? Um, favorite food? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, nothing Nothing comes to my mind right now. I enjoy everything. Actually, only since last year or so, I became tried. I eat vegetarian even when I'm outside. Right. And uh, so, in Indian food, I think just simple food I like. Uh, okay. And sweets. I love rasgulla. Okay. Or something. And what about you, Swamiji? <laughs> um, I love whatever is healthy, other than grass, of course. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just joking. So, yes, my first thing is the food I'm eating has to be healthy. And this is a message also for everybody that I like to share and also with you, uh, yourself with it. That if you sleep well, remember mindset is not all about emotional mindset. 
it is also how much nutrients we're supplying to the body that can make a huge difference to how you're feeling, thinking, acting, and speaking. So, right amount of protein, right amount of fat, good fat, and multivitamins, absolutely critical. Okay. And staying away from fried foods, too sugary carb foods, you need sugar. Because mm. if you're thinking for six hours, your mm. body needs sugar. It's using energy. But limiting it goes a long way. <coughs> so I'd like to thank you again. Thank you, Vidit. It was lovely you having you on board. Thank you, everyone who um, who joined us. That was um, Vid Vidit Gujarati and his uh, chess grandmaster. Uh, and he is such an adorable person, an adorable person, lovely personality, great uh, temperament and... Uh, I'm sure you will do something remarkable with your life, even more beautiful. And and I think you do have the potential to be world number one. Mm. And it's almost entirely in your hands to close the gap. So go for it. Thank you, Swamiji. It's all your blessings. It's divine grace. Thank you very much, everybody.